We're going to take a moment to appreciate the beauty in this. This is a guy who wears a mask, yeah? To hide his true identity. And underneath that mask, he wears makeup to hide his identity more. <laughs> How the fuck did he do this on his own consistently? Can you imagine Amon constantly applying and reapplying his makeup just to layer his disguise? It seems beyond stupid, but maybe I'm overthinking it. Maybe it's not so crazy after all. When you stop to think about it, women do it for most of their entire lives. So, as it turns out, it's not a non-bender with a grudge against benders. It's an uppity bender with crazy psychic bloodbending powers on some holy crusade. But why? Well, we've got to delve into some last minute flashback territory to answer that one. Amon's real name is Noatok. He and Tarlock are brothers. <sighs> You wouldn't think so since they meet in the 10th episode and Tarlock doesn't initially recognize anything about his brother. Say, his voice, his startling resistance to bloodbending. But in the next episode, he admits that he recognized- When he took my bending, the sensation was somehow familiar. I later recognized it as my brother's bloodbending grip. Okay. They're the sons of a man named Yakon, who back in the day was a crime lord in the criminal underbelly of Republic City. Avatar Aang took him in for the crime of bloodbending. What crime he committed with bloodbending is never mentioned, but who cares, it's plot. The thing about Yukon is that he's a bloodbender without any of the limits prescribed in the original show. He doesn't need the full moon to power his bending, and he barely needs freedom of movement. A few flicks of his fingers and he can take out an entire room. Look at Aang, help us to face all this retconning. How embarrassing. Now, the show tries to hand wave all of this away by pointing out that Toph discovered metal bending, a once impossible feat, but Fuck off. Metal bending never defied the logic of earth bending. Toph never bended actual metal, only the fragments of earth within them. It was routine earth bending that she adapted with her seismic radar ability. It followed the rules. Bending was always mind and body over matter. Yukon's bending, however, is just the mind over matter. And additionally, it runs counter to everything we knew about blood bending. One, that it absolutely required the full moon. And two, that the user went through the motions of water bending because it was still just water bending at its core. Yukon skips all of this and Legend of Korra asks that we accept it. Not gonna happen! No, not gonna happen! <laughs> the only other exception to regular bending that I can think of from Avatar would be Sparky Sparky Boom Man, who definitely just bloated things with his mind. Or rather, with this little tattooed doohickey on his forehead. But with firebenders, their power was generated from within, so if things like fire breathing were possible without auxiliary motions, sending out miniaturized explosions, while a bit of a stretch, isn't a deal breaker. Of course, the show made sure you knew Sparky Sparky Boom Man was an aberration, and it never delved into any dark and tragic past beyond what inferences the audience could make about his metal limbs and such. He was just a scary-ass contract killer with an unexplainable power that remained in the background until he exploded. Judging from Yukon though, who's pivotal to at least two major character arcs, you can be a psychic god if you really want to be. Martial arts are for chumps. Oh my god, my avatar limbs, it hurts, ah. Bitch, please. So Yukon escaped and got himself some plastic surgery for, I don't fucking know why, because he promptly left Republic City to hide out in the Northern Water Tribe. He had his sons, Noatok and Tarlock, and when he discovered they were waterbenders, he relentlessly taught them his psychic abilities to later have his revenge in the avatar, because that worked out so well the first time. Noatok took to it pretty well. Tarlock didn't. Either way, they eventually had enough of their father's shit. Noatok ran off and Tarlock left after Yukon died a couple years later. Saddled with daddy issues, the two tried to take over Republic City in their own ways. Tarlock went the more official route and infiltrated the not really a Republic as a government official while Noatok inexplicably learned to remove people's bending and then formed a terrorist cult around his power. Now, why does Tarlock want to take over the city? The consensus on the internet is that he wanted to prove himself as better than his father and do some good in the world by aspiring to take over Republic City by force. I get that there are purported to be shades of grey involved and admittedly that's a keystone to good writing, but at what point when Tarlock was manipulating Korra, even going as far as to arrest her friends as blackmail, did he really think to himself, take 
that, Dad. <laughs> if the story didn't outright exposit Tarlock's goals and motivations at the last minute, nobody would be wrong in thinking he was the soldier of revenge his father wanted. Instead, Mike and Brian make absolutely sure that you know that there's a deeper layer to all of this by literally pausing the story to tell you about it. Best writers ever! I'm going to give Legend of Korra this. Tarlock's arc was actually pretty okay. In fact, it's awfully similar to Fire Lord Sozin's character arc in the episode The Avatar and the Fire Lord. Same as Tarlock, Sozin wanted pretty desperately to do something good for the world but did a lot of bad things to make it happen, and his good intentions eventually paved the road to a certain kind of hell. Hey, it happens. In that light, I'm willing to give Tarlock's arc a pass. The bloodbending is such monumental bullshit though that it fails to have much impact. Now why does Noah Talk want to wipe out all benders? That I couldn't tell you. Noah Talk is easily one of the world's most powerful benders, being a psychic god like his father was. He even takes his father down for bullying Tarlock, and then he, uh, runs off, abandoning them both. Wait, what? Why'd you do that, Noah Talk? Did you just decide then and there that the only way to help your brother was to rid the world of bending? I mean, way to think big, I guess, but leaving Tarlock behind with an obsessive maniac who you just humiliated big time isn't especially helpful to anybody. Did you really despise your brother's weakness? Is that why you attempted to force equality on everyone by eliminating both weakness and strength? Or did you decide to hate all bending at some later undefined point for some other undefined reason? Well, who fucking knows? In any case, Noah Talk truly seemed to believe that bending is the source of all that's wrong in the world. Why that is is up to so much interpretation that it's like Mike and Brian didn't even have an answer to it. The consensus on the internet is that Noah Talk was only ever trying to escape his father's shadow by complying with Yakone's revenge fantasy to destroy the Avatar. I just, I, I don't, uh huh? See, the character of Amon worked because he was more of an idea than a person. The idea of a non-bending antagonist out for vengeance against benders, who manipulates and entrenches the city's non-bending population into a self-victimizing mentality to achieve his goals. I can buy that. I wanted that. But what we got was a bender that was perhaps so self-loathing that he went after all other benders because of daddy issues? And I don't buy it. Partly because the truth's unloaded all in this penultimate episode with a, oh by the way, expository flashback, but also because it's simply not engaging. It's easy to root for Amon's character because, well, even without overt systematic pressure against non-benders, there's the implicit notion that benders are more powerful. Amon was made to feel powerless in his dark, tragic past, which makes him sympathetic in his pursuit for control. The audience can root for him in his warped ideal even though he's a liar and a brute because he's still an underdog at least in some measure. Plus, a non-bender being so competent a fighter that he can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with benders is just damn fucking cool. Noah Talk, though, is different. He has all the power in the world, but he just so happens to have some steamed event and it doesn't really matter where. So he throws a scaled-up extended temper tantrum. Some pro Noah Talk arguments I've seen online say that, well, Amon's mask had to come off sometime. If Amon were really what he said on the tin, that would have been boring. Which is just stupid. To want so badly for there to be a last-minute twist that any old mediocre twist will do? Amon was a great villain from the start, and there was never a need to unmask him at all. His mask was a symbol, a representation of what he stood for, as twisted as his beliefs may have been. For example, no one sat through the dark night, waiting for the moment that Batman scrubbed the Joker's face clean to uncover his true identity. What Joker stood for, chaos, the unrepentant barbarity of man, and how all that held up a mirror to Batman's own actions, that's what made him a great villain. You complete me. To them, you're just a freak. Like me. Darth Vader is another great example of this. He was never a particularly deep or multifaceted villain, but he was everything Luke Skywalker needed to overcome to be a Jedi Knight and save the galaxy. This is precisely why Ozai worked too, despite being about as one-dimensional. Ozai was everything that Aang wasn't, and everything that Aang needed to surpass to come into his own as the Avatar and save the world. The Fire Lord was the classical power-hungry villain archetype, which happened to be the perfect big baddie for the Avatar narrative. Likewise, Amon held up a mirror to Korra. Benders as a whole might not have been keeping non-benders down, but they certainly had the potential to, and Kor's disgustingly egocentric actions reflected that potential. He was the one thing Bright got right about Legend of Korra, but god forbid they have someone be interesting, so they made him into a masked man wearing makeup. It'd have been cool to have two badass villains, one a bender and one a non-bender, to explore both sides of the bending divide with plenty of shades of grey along the way so that at least I'd be able to say, well the villains were good, too bad Kor was such a gigantic bitch. Unfortunately, what we got were two waterbenders with unexplainable Gary Stew powers who, coincidentally, wreaked havoc on the same city because unbeknownst to the both of them, they were brothers all along. Speaking of, so when Noah Talk is outed for the filthy liar that he is, he kinda just 
runs away. Kor doesn't defeat him or pursue him or do much of anything to stop him. Epic. Noah Talk retrieves his baby bro and they ride off into the sunset. It's kind of a happy ending for the two of them. Oh. Well, once again, Cora doesn't have to do anything for her problems to solve themselves. Yay! Alas, there's barely even a mention of Amon, and there's not the hint of a leftover influence on Republic City. The whole affair is swept under the rug like it never happened. Continuity? What's that? Can I smoke it? Cora, all heartbroken that her bending was taken away, or at least three quarters of it, and that she'll never again get to pretend to be the Avatar, saddles up and goes home. With everybody. Presumably, this is because Katara can undo Noatok's damage for everybody with healing. And no cigar. But wait, Katara. Katara's a bloodbender too, ain't she? As blocking chi with bloodbending denotes a physical block, couldn't Katara just reverse what Noatok did and remove the block? No, oh, I guess it's not a full moon out, so Korra's lost her bending forever! So Korra runs off to some cliffside and has a little cry. Anybody remember Aang having a little cry? Aang? What are you doing here? When we hit our lowest point, we are open to the greatest change. Are you fucking kidding me? How does energy bending reverse the effects of a physical block? How is Aang even here when Korra has shown an absolute lack of spiritual growth for 12 fucking episodes? Why doesn't Aang and the rest of the Avatar incarnations just possess Korra and live her goddamn life for her? Not even the fans can justify this one and they haven't fucking tried. But for me, this moment illustrated the entire fucking show. Korra disobeys every piece of advice ever given to her destroys the established eternal logic of the Avatar universe at her whim and is a repulsive, disrespectful cunt to everyone she meets. In the moral of her story, if you have a vagina and functional tear ducts, you don't have to do fucking shit. Just stand around and let everybody fix all of your problems. She's the most useless, nauseating, all-around offensive waste of space of a character that I've ever fucking seen. Fuck. But everybody lived happily ever after. All's well that fucking ends well. The End. What's wrong? You got nothing else to say? I'm the Avatar! You gotta deal with it! 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 Wait, nope, that was just season one, folks. There are three more seasons of Korra acting like a nasty histrionic devil spawn. Oh, but she does get better, say the delusional Korra tards. She eventually sees the wrongness in her ways and turns a new leaf. <coughs> nope. I'm here to tell you that she gets worse with each season. Not only her, but everybody around her, actually. With the possible exclusion of Tenzin, who remains the lone sensible man woefully entombed in his show. Continuity errors abound, ranging all the way back to the original show with some of the most egregious retconning I've seen in anything. The villains get stupider, the plots make even less sense, the pandering becomes more pandery, and it even got to the point that the incompetent morons at Nickelodeon went, Whoa there, we can't be airing this shit on TV, think of the children, man. And yes, guys, season 3 and 4 were bad. Fucking awful, actually. If you're not blind and deaf. 